Welcome back, everybody. Today we are going to be reading chapters three and four of Mission Unstoppable in the Genius File series by Dan Gutman. And I just wanted to let you all know that I am recording from my house. So like many of you, I have some pets that are around me. So I just wanted to take a second to show you that just right next to me, right here out of the camera, I have my friend that's an albino parakeet that I know I showed you a picture of at the beginning of the year named Albus Dumbledore. And I just wanted to take a second to show you that he's reading along with us and listening to the story too. Now that you and me and Albus are ready to start reading, let's go ahead and get started. This is chapter three and it is called Flying. So I want you to take a second to think about and remember where we left off. The last thing that we heard in chapter two, take a second and remember where we were. So we were at the point where Coke and Pepsi were just jumping off of the cliff. So that's where we're gonna pick up right here. Chances are you've never fallen off a cliff. If you had, you probably wouldn't be reading this right now because you would be dead. But have you ever jumped off a high diving board? Have you ever dropped into a steep water slide or a half pipe? Have you ever been on a really high roller coaster? Have any of you ever done that? I personally don't like roller coasters, but I know what feeling they're talking about because I don't like that feeling. But some people really like that feeling. Well, forget it. Falling off a cliff is nothing like any of those experiences. You still have no idea what the McDonald twins were going through. When you fall off a cliff, the first 40 or 50 feet are a straight vertical drop. The only thing you feel in the first second or two is sheer terror. You can't think about anything else. The good thing is, and this is probably the only good thing, you can't worry about your problems. If your parents have been bugging you or some kid at school has been hassling you, you don't think about it anymore. If you have an ache or a pain in any part of your body, it's gone instantly. In fact, you can't think at all. You can only experience. It's all sensory. Your nervous system goes into survival mode. Nothing else matters. You may even lose control of your bladder. Luckily, in this case, that didn't happen. That really paints a picture in my mind. I can really picture the fear that they're having going off this cliff. After they tumbled over the edge, the twins spun and twisted and flopped around in the air, screaming their heads off the whole time. I would be too. One thought did flash through Coke's brain for a millisecond. I had just pushed my sister off a cliff. What had he done? But he had no choice. If he hadn't pushed Pep and then jumped, he surely would have taken one of those poison darts in the neck, just like that lady Maya did. He had made a snap decision, and he would have to live with it. Or die with it. Rocks, ledges, and trees shot past Pep's eyes as she plummeted. Something flashed through her mind two for a millisecond. I will never be nice to my brother again. That was the last straw, she thought. She would never again update Coke's iPod for him or help him pick out clothes so he wouldn't look nerdy. Not that it would matter because they were both about to die. When you're at an amusement park, no matter how terrifying the ride is, you know you're not going to die at the end. Somebody with an advanced engineering degree, carefully designed the thrill to stimu the still carefully designated that thrill ride to simulate weightlessness. You know that thousands of people took that same ride before you did, and they all survived. You know that a safety inspector with a clipboard is required by law to check out the rides regularly. You know that after a minute or two, the ride is going to come to an end. You'll climb out of the little car or whatever and go enjoy some cotton candy. But when you go flying off a cliff, there are no such assurances. At the end of the free fall, your body will most likely smash into the hard surface of the ground with thousands of pounds of pressure, crushing your flimsy bones. 
Your internal organs are going to explode like little water balloons. Or maybe you'll get dashed against the rocks on the side of the cliff and fracture your skull on the way down. What an unpleasant way to end a life. But then again, it would be quick and painless. At one second into free fall, Coke and Pep were moving about 30 miles per hour straight down. The wind was whipping, ripping past them as they accelerated, pulling at the skin on their cheeks. There was a roar in their ears, like the sound of a jet taking off in their head. Through squinted eyes, Coke could see Pep below him, flailing her arms and legs, trying to turn herself around. At that point, they were dropping like stones. By three seconds into the free fall, they were close to 60 miles per hour and still picking up speed. Coke had once leafed through a physics book in the library and learned a few facts about falling objects. For instance, any falling object will accelerate until it reaches what is called terminal velocity. For a human, about 120 miles per hour. So I want you to take a second to think about that. So I want you to imagine whenever your parents are driving on the freeway and you're in the car, they go about 60 miles per hour is the fastest that you can go on a freeway. So picture the fastest, the terminal velocity for a human is about 120 miles per hour. So that's twice as fast as your parents are driving on the freeway. That's pretty fast. But terminal velocity varies depending on the object that's falling. A large flat object, like a piece of paper, will fall a lot slower than a penny. When the twins stuck out their arms and legs, their rate of descent slowed down. Suddenly, Coke realized what he was doing. He had seen a YouTube video about something called wingsuit base jumping just a few weeks earlier. If you want to see what that's all about and you want to see the wingsuits in action, go to the end of the video, and I have a video linked there that shows you what kind of suits they are using and what base jumping looks like. People jump off cliffs wearing only these strange-looking wingsuits and they can actually fly. It blew his mind. Coke had just been intrigued enough to do a Google search of wingsuit base jumping. Go ahead and look it up. People actually jump off cliffs for fun, and they've been doing it since the 1930s. According to legend, 72 of the first 75 people who tried it died. Then in the 1990s, a French skydiver named Patrick de Gayardin developed a wingsuit that worked Well, it worked some of the time anyway. He died in 1998 after jumping off a cliff in Hawaii. But other skydivers took up the sport and better wingsuits were designed. Coke realized he didn't have to die. The wingsuit could save him. At four seconds, Coke remembered what Maya told them. Extend your arms and legs. You will soar like a hawk. I want you to think about this. So this whole chapter leading up until this has been their thoughts in four seconds. So that's pretty quickly, but whenever you're falling down a cliff, I imagine your thoughts go pretty fast. Not to get all scientific on you, but if you throw gravity, acceleration, air resistance, and hundreds of feet of vertical drop into an equation, and then you add the fabric of a wingsuit as it rushes against the wind like the wing of an airplane, you begin to get lift. And when you're falling off a cliff, lift is a very good thing to have. When wearing a wingsuit, you can manipulate your flight by changing the angle of attack or the position of your body, or by loosening or tightening the fabric of the wingsuit. A typical skydiver will free fall 110 to 140 miles per hour. Wearing a wingsuit, you can eventually reduce that to as little as 25 miles per hour. Coke extended his arms and legs as far as he could, and instantly he felt the air resistance. It was so... He was starting to move, not just down, but also forward. He felt himself slowing and leveling off like a glider. The air rushing by caught the fabric between his limbs, and the wingsuit billowed out. His body had been turned into an airfoil. He looked down and saw that his sister had figured out the same thing. If you had been standing on the beach on that sunny day and had looked up, you would have seen two almost almost teenagers slingshotting over your head, face down, with their arms and legs wide apart, to catch the wind. They were flying. Here's a picture of what it could have looked like.
From the dawn of time, when the first primitive humans looked up in the sky and saw birds above them, they probably wished they could fly. How glorious it would be to soar overhead. For all of our intelligence, our technology, and the progress we've made over the centuries, many of us would be happy to give it all up if we could only become birds. Being a human is great. Nothing beats being at the top of the food chain. Opposable thumbs are handy for picking things up. But if only we could fly. Coke took a moment to look around. Below was the beach. To the right, in the distance, he could see his neighborhood. The cliffs of Point Reyes are more than a thousand feet above the Pacific Ocean. It looks like a long way down when you're standing on the beach looking up. From the other direction, as you're dropping by, it doesn't seem that far at all. Just as Coke and Pep were starting to relax and their heart race, rates were returning to something approaching normal, both twins had the same terrible thought. How am I supposed to land? They were moving almost 60 miles per hour. You wouldn't jump out of a car that was moving 60 miles per hour. The wingsuits had no source of power to keep the two of them in the air. Without a source of power, gravity always wins in the end. Their eyes widened as they saw objects on the ground getting bigger. There wasn't a lot of time. I want you to think about that. Think about being in the wingsuit and you know that you're going to have to land soon, but you're not sure how to land and the ground keeps coming closer and closer. You have to figure out how you will land. Coke looked down. The thing had to have a parachute attached to it. In old war movies, skydivers always pulled a ripcord to open their chute. The ground was coming up fast. Desperately, Coke reached behind him. His hand found some cloth, and he yanked it. The material gave way, and Coke felt something happening behind him. He turned around to see a red, huge canopy unfurling over his head. There was a big jolt when the canopy caught the air, and then, as it opened all the way, it yanked him and slowed him down even further. He saw Pep's yellow chute open just before his did. She was about 200 feet in front of him. They weren't flying anymore. They were floating. Woo-hoo! Coke shouted. Somewhere in the back of his brain, he remembered hearing the expression, hit the ground, running. He knew what it meant, to get started on a project quickly. But now he realized where the expression came from. A parachutist has to hit the ground running. If parachutists don't, they're going to hit the ground hard and probably break their legs. The twins felt themselves touch the sandy beach and ran as if they were being chased by a pack of wild dogs. It felt like they had been in the air for an eternity, but in fact, it had been less than 10 seconds. This whole chapter, we're nearing the end of it. The whole duration of the chapter was just 10 seconds. Panting, breathless, Pep forgot what she'd thought about her brother after he pushed her off the cliff. She ran over and hugged him tightly. Then she got down on all fours and kissed the ground. All right, that's the end of the third chapter. We are now going to get started on the fourth chapter. This is called Home Sweet Home. For a minute or two, the twins knelt in the sand, catching their breath, clearing their heads, and trying to comprehend what had just happened to them. Except for a few seagulls circling overhead, the beach was empty. Nobody had seen them land. Finally, Coke looked, up, Coke looked up at the cliffs and marveled that he had jumped from such a great height and survived. I told you we should have taken the bus, Pep said, panting. What fun would that have been? Coke replied. Pep unzipped her wingsuit and peeled it off. There was a dumpster down the beach. She crumpled the suit and parachute into a big ball and stuffed them into the dumpster. Coke did the same. The wingsuits probably cost somebody hundreds of dollars, but neither of the twins ever wanted to see those things again. If you had the wingsuit, would you throw it away after this? I'm not sure if I would. I don't think I would. Together, Coke and Pep climbed the wooden steps leading off the beach to the main road. Looking around, they knew they were about a mile from home. How are we going to tell mom and dad about this? Pep asked. Are you crazy? Coke replied. We're not going to say a word to mom or dad. You know how they worry. They would never believe it anyway. 
The twins hiked away from the beach into the hills and along the narrow road until they approached Point Reyes Station. In a small town in the middle of a national park called Point Reyes National Seashore, soon they could see their house. There was an RV parked in front with the words, Cruise America, painted on the side, and there were two figures on the front lawn. They're waiting for us, Pep said, groaning. And so they were. Dr. and Mrs. McDonald had been sitting on lawn chairs, fretting, and looking up and down the street with binoculars. When they spotted the twins walking toward them, they jumped up to greet them. You're late, Dr. McDonald hollered. Why weren't you on the school bus? We decided to walk home, Coke said, hoping that would end the, dis the discussion. Both of you are a mess, Mrs. McDonald yelled. What were you doing? Wrestling on the beach? Is that any way to treat your school clothes? We were worried sick, Dr. McDonald went on. We thought something terrible might have happened. The twins shot glances at each other. If only they knew. We're sorry, they said in unison. It's amazing how a simple, sincere apology will usually melt the hardest of hearts, at least temporarily. Dr. McDonald threw an arm around each of his children and pulled them close. I'm just going to show you right here. There's a picture of the RV that they were describing being right there. That's what they're walking up to. Anything exciting happened today? He asked. The twins looked at each other again. Nah, Coke said. Same stuff, different day. Tell us the truth, their mother said. Were you two in detention again? No, Coke replied indignantly. Don't be ridiculous. We just uh, jumped off a cliff and parachuted home. Ah ha ha, Dr. McDonald chortled. I love you kids. Five more minutes and we were going to call the police to report you missing, you know, Mrs. McDonald told them. Where are your backpacks? Pep had no answer for that one. They had ditched their backpacks up on the cliff when that Maya lady gave them the wingsuits to wear. Pep looked at her brother, who was a much more skillful liar than she. We left him at school, Coke said. We'll get him tomorrow. There is no homework. You should have called home, Mrs. McDonald said sternly. Why do you think we got you cell phones? We forgot, Coke said. When in doubt, we forgot can get you just can get you out of just about any mess you get yourself into. It may make you look like an airhead, but that's better than admitting the real reason you did the dumb thing you did. You'd forget your heads if they weren't screwed onto your necks, Dr. McDonald said. Actually, Dad, our heads aren't screwed on, Coke replied. They're attached with tendons, ligaments, muscles, that sort of thing. If heads were screwed on, it would be a simple matter to do a head transplant. Dr. McDonald shook his head. Kids. He was the kind of man who was organized almost to the point of obsession. Everything in his office was tidy, efficient, labeled, and filed in alphabetical, chronological, or numeral order. Sounds like the library. He took pride in the fact that he could put his finger on any piece of paper he needed within seconds. It was inconceivable to him why his children lacked this essential human trait. They must have inherited a scatterbrained gene from their mother, he assumed. Mrs. McDonald prepared an early dinner while the twins showered and changed their clothes upstairs. Her husband's professional life revolved around the serious study of American history, but her interests were different. Mrs. McDonald was the founder and only employee of Amazing But True, a web-based magazine devoted to odd facts and, some would argue, useless information. Every day, almost a million people clicked on the site to learn that, for instance, the total surface area of two human lungs would just about fill a tennis court or some other piece of trivia. Neither of the McDonald parents made a lot of money, but Mrs. McDonald's income from Amazing But True was more than the salary Dr. McDonald earned teaching history at the university. Because of this, when tough family decisions needed to be made, 
It was usually Mrs. McDonald who called the shots. She rang the little bell she kept in the kitchen, and the rest of the family charged down from the second floor. Spaghetti was on the table. Any anger Mrs. McDonald had about the children coming home late from school was gone. She heaped meatballs on everyone's plates. Are you kids excited about our trip? She asked, after they had dug into their food. We should be somewhere in the Midwest next week for your birthday, and you know we've got to get to Washington, D.C. by July 4th for Aunt Judy's wedding. In all the excitement, Coke and Pep had almost forgotten. In two days after school let out for summer, they would be leaving for a driving vacation that would take them nearly 3,000 miles across the United States and then back. I can't wait, Pep gushed, with just a bit more enthusiasm than was necessary. In fact, she was dreading the trip. At home, there were new clothes that needed to be tried on, texts from friends that needed to be replied to, videos and TV shows that needed to be watched, and websites that needed to be surfed. It will be good for you kids to see Mount Rushmore, the National Parks, and the Lincoln Mem Memorial, said Dr. MacDonald. All those things you learn about in school, but never see with your own eyes. Oh, that reminds me, Mrs. McDonald said. You'll never believe what I found out today. Do you know what they have in Cocker City, Kansas? What? Everybody said. The largest ball of twine in the world, Mrs. McDonald told the family. Some guy spent years rolling twine in his garage to create this ball, and now it's gigantic. We can see it on our way west. Coke glanced over at Pep to see if she was giggling. Their mom always got excited when she heard about some new oddball place that she could put on Amazing But True. Pep avoided making eye contact with her brother because she knew it would crack her up. Dr. McDonald just rolled his eyes. It's just a silly ball of twine, Bridge, he said. He had shortened Bridget to Bridge on their first date and had been calling his wife that ever since. It's not just any ball of twine, Ben, Mrs. McDonald shot back. It's the biggest one in the world. It's twine, Dr. McDonald argued, even though he knew from experience that arguing with his wife was a waste of time. It's not the Grand Canyon. It's not Mount Everest. It's a ball of string. I must see it with my own eyes. She replied simply. And that was the end of the discussion. Dr. MacDonald shook his head. One of the things that attracted him to his wife in the first place was their mutual interest in history. Only later did he realize that she was interested in the history of nonsense. Ooh, Albus is liking this part. Weird places, meaningless facts, strange people, enormous balls of twine. Coke knew about the ball of twine in Kansas. In second grade, he had read about it in the Weekly Reader. He remembered that it weighed almost nine tons. I should probably mention here that, in fact, Coke McDonald remembered just about everything he had ever seen or experienced. The school psychologist tested him and told Coke he had an eidetic or photographic memory. In his mind, he could see just about any image he had ever seen with his eyes. In second grade, Coke had memorized the periodic table of elements, all the way to Ludricinium, and he did it without trying. Okay, okay, we'll go see that silly ball of twine if it will make you happy, Dr. MacDonald said, grumpily. Coke had a theory to explain grown-ups, as he did for most things in life. In his view, babies are born with a specific number of brain cells which waste away and die off as people get older. So by the time they reach 30, and certainly by the time they reach 40, most of their brain cells are gone. This explains why grown-ups do and say things that they do. To back up his theory, in third grade, Koch did a school research project involving music. He made a list of the greatest composers in history, from Beethoven to the Beatles. Then he tracked when they wrote their best music, Irving Berlin wrote his first song, Alexander's Ragtime Band, when he was just 23 years old. The Beatles made Sgt. Pepper's Lonely, Club, Lonely Hearts Club Band, their most innovative album, when John Lennon was 27 and Paul McCartney was 25. 
Beethoven started going deaf at 31. Mozart was composing minutes at age 5 and was dead at 35. Almost as a rule, composers created their finest work in their 20s. There was a severe drop after the age 30. This, to Koch, was proof that the human brain deteriorates by the time people become parents. Which explains why parents are so weird. They're essentially operating with an empty skull filled with dead brain cells. The spaghetti hit the spot. The rest of the dinner conversation was all about the cross-country trip. They would be heading out in two days, after the last day of school. It was Dr. McDonald's view that all Americans should travel cross-country at least once in their lives. You can't see America by flying over it, he told the family. You've got to hit the open road, breathe in the fresh air, explore the country like the pioneers did. We'll be like modern-day Lewis and Clark. Did Lewis and Clark have an RV? asked Coke, smirking. Maybe we'll be like the modern-day Donner Party, Pep remarked. Very funny, said Mrs. McDonald. The Donner Party consisted of a group of families from Illinois who tried to get to California in 1846. They got caught in the early winter snowstorms, ran out of food, and were for forced to resort to cannibalism to survive. Pep found the Donner Party fascinating. If we had to eat one of us, she said as she held up a meatball with her fork. Which one of us would you eat? I'd eat Dad, Coke replied. He weighs the most and he's got the most meat on him. But it's mostly fat, Pep, Pep countered. Mom would be more tender. Are you calling me fat? asked Dr. McDonald. That's sick, Mrs. McDonald said. No Donner Party talk over dinner. The dishes were cleared away and the table sponged off. Dr. and Mrs. McDonald went upstairs to begin packing for the trip leaving the twins to load the dishwasher. Remember that lady in the red suit we met at the top of the cliff? Pep asked her brother. Yeah, Coke recalled. Her name was Maya. Do you think she's dead? Both twins shuddered at the thought. Maybe, Coke said. I remember what she said right after the dart hit her on the neck. T. G. F. Oh yeah, what do you think that means? Thank God it's Friday, Coke guessed. Today is Thursday, Pep told him. It has to mean something else. Beats me, he replied. It's probably nothing. Those bowler dudes in the golf carts probably weren't even after us. Maybe they were trying to get somebody else. Pep added detergent to the dishwasher and turned it on. You know, she told her brother, I don't really want to go cross country, but now I think this is a good time for us to go on a long trip. Why? Because I have the feeling that somebody out there is trying to kill us. And that is where we are going to leave off for today. So we will start up with chapter five tomorrow. Thank you again for listening. And I hope you have a good day and take some time to go play outside.